Thank you, Professor Yuan. Uh, uh, thanks for, for the invitation. Uh, we, we know each other for a long time, so since 1997, uh, when we were both in the National University of Singapore. So it's an honor to be here to talk about this, uh, uh, this work. We have done this for a number of years, so I will talk about uh, three studies today. So the first one is uh, uh, about uh, the endowment effect of victory auction. So this was done by uh, Jen Kletch, me, and also Richard Thiller. Uh, Richard Thiller got the Nobel Prize in 2017, not because of this work, right, or for his other behavioral finance stuff. So let's see how this works, because we have three parts, so I will go slightly fast. Uh, but please uh, don't hesitate to interrupt me uh, at any minute. So uh, if you have any uh, issues or questions, so we can discuss. It seems that I uh, use this one. Uh, uh, one thing I want to clarify first, that uh, basically all the media papers, the newspapers uh, in 2017, they wrote that uh, uh, Professor Thiele found the uh, endowment effect, which was totally wrong. Uh, Professor Thiele did not identify the endowment effect. The endowment effect came from two biologists. Uh, so <laughs> it's a very interesting. Hamak and Brown. Hamak and Brown in 1974, they found uh, uh, one very interesting uh, phenomenon for the wild duck hunters. So. They interviewed, the, they did the survey uh, study. They asked the people, so if we lose this uh, wetland, if you ask for compensation, because you won't be able to hunt the wild ducks here, how much money do you demand? And if you, uh, if you want to keep the wetland, how much money you want to pay? So they found out something very interesting. So they found out that uh, People are willing to pay on average US dollar 247 to keep the wetland. But if they lose the wetland, if they lose the possibility to hunt the wild dogs, they demand for 1,044 US dollars for compensation. This is ridiculous because that's exactly the same thing, exactly the same wetland. What they ask? is 4.2 times higher for compensation than what they are willing to pay. The willingness to pay is something like the tanks, right? I'm willing to pay the tanks to, for example, to keep the air clean for the air pollution. Or well, the other side is, which is exactly the same thing. The other thing is that, so if the air pollution, for instance, damages your house, how much you are willing to accept for your compensation? So that's the same thing for the budget. So this was identified in 1974. Later on, a lot of studies have, have been done by uh, Kletch, Zenden, and Daniel Kahneman actually uh, also joined this uh, group. Uh, in fact, he was one of our initial four authors because of some sickness, so he could not do much work. He, he was very modest. He insisted to remove his limb from our paper. So Kahneman, Kletch, and Theodore say uh, in the 1990 paper, this is a classic paper, so they did the experiments uh, on the endowment effect. The conclusion is that it has nothing to do with Coase theory. Yeah, this was a very important part. So then the explanation for uh, people there, so the explanation what they would offer is for the prospect theory, to say that the gains for the generic van. So we see the generic uh, value functions. For this part, what you can see for the gains part, the curve is smooth. But for the pain part, the curve is much steeper. So therefore, this means that uh, if you ask something to compensate, so you are asking something more because you think it's a pain uh, rather than uh, something you get. For bidding and valuation part, there is a lot of literature, <laughs> interestingly. In 1994, Shogren, Shin, and Hales, and uh, uh, Kribenstein, 
These four people published one paper in AER. They claimed that they have resolved the differences in willingness to pay and willingness to accept. What they did is that they introduced the victory auction. You see that if we introduce victory auction, we auction. So all the rights, the differences will go away. Uh, but uh, Jen Kletch and Danny Kahneman, Jen Kletch and Thaler, Richard Thaler, they did not believe in this story. Uh, there was a, a, a big debate there. You can see Morrison and the other, uh, the, the, the comment, reply, all those things. Victor Auction was uh, a game theoretic paper published in Journal of Finance in 1961. Uh, uh, Victor, Professor Victor won Nobel Prize with uh, Professor James Muniz uh, in 1996. Uh, Jim just passed away uh, a few months ago. So in 2001, we published one paper in Experimental Economics, uh, although the AER rejected our paper, but doesn't matter, because our paper uh, was later reprinted in uh, a number of uh, things which has got some influence. So we introduced uh, Jen Kletch and I did a larger paper in 2006, so I will uh, briefly talk about this. What's the issue here? The issue for the showground study is that so they introduced the victory auction for only one object. They actually they did something quite uh, astonishing. They asked people to eat some hamburg, possibly with with, uh, with some pollution, so which may cause you sick. <laughs> so they ask you for the assess the risk and how much you are willing to pay for that, but only one object. So this is, here comes the problem. So Jen Kletch and uh, uh, Richard Saylor, they did some experiments first in Canada. What they did was the following. Uh, very simple, very simple, uh, but quite striking, you will see. In Simon Fraser, they recruited 80 subjects, eight groups. Each group have 10 subjects. So there are two groups of 10 buyers, two groups of 10 sellers, which is for the second price auction. Second price auction means that Victor auction has a very special feature, which means that you bid for the, the highest bidder pays the second highest price. So victory auction theoretically is the only one which says that truth telling is a dominant strategy. You don't try to lie because there is low profit to lie, low possibility for manipulation. You simply bid what you think its valuation is. How much you think it when it's valuation for you, how much you're going to bid. So this is a theoretical uh, property, the only one so far. So here, uh, the auction goes for this way. Uh, they for the second price auction, which means that they auction one object. So the object goes to the highest bidder, but the bidder pays for the second highest price not his price or her price. And uh, the design goes the, uh, uh, the following. The other groups, ten group, two groups of 10 buyers and two groups of 10 sellers for the ninth price auction. The ninth price auction means that there are eight objects. The eight highest bidders get the object, but they only pay the ninth highest price the price one level lower. So it's a very clever design. There, so, uh, to, be, to make sure that subjects do not uh, suffer from this experiment, so they pay $10 for participation fee. The take home income is the initial income $10, collecting dollars, plus the value of any good you sell. If you sell something, you get some money, or minus the something you buy. So participation fee tries to ensure that people will get some money there. Later on, we removed this one. Uh, so this is, a, uh, this is a careful one So because uh, they did not have uh, experience before, so they tried this one first. 
Each subject in this experiment was given an identification number. Therefore, nobody knows their true identity. Right? You just use like all those auctions. You you raise your uh, you raise your card. Right? Uh, so that's a number. Instructions are given carefully and in general, and explain the rules of the market, of the auction, and also give the subjects two test questions to see whether they understand the experiment or not. So everything must be checked out very carefully before the experiment to make sure that people know what is going on. So what the auctions are? The auctions SFU marks. We are auctioning a lot of marks and it was a memory sticks. So the marks were shown and given to the subjects, like you people sitting here, so gave it everybody. So it was a paper and a pen and a pencil experiment. No computer, no laboratory. It's very simple. So they, they also put one press sending, which was fourteen Canadian dollars. So they don't allow for any price higher than that because they don't want to lose control. But actually, nobody went beyond that. So later on, we removed this constraint as well. Six successful rounds of each auction conducted. It's said, bid, or offers. You write down on a piece of paper, close it, and give to the experimenter, like all those engineering projects bidding. So after the six round, after each round, the transaction price was revealed, right? Which one? But not the identity. You will know what price was the transaction price, but you do not know the bidding price of the bidders. You don't know the distribution. So it's identity not disclosed. And then after the six rounds of auctions, one round of the six auctions would be randomly selected afterwards. This is to try to force people to be serious at each round. We don't want to pay them every round because we need to see how they learn there. The exchanges and payments were made accordingly. So let's see the results. The results are quite interesting. Yeah. What you can see is that for the second price auction, so the results, this is the ratio, the mean willingness to pay to willingness to accept ratio in Vancouver, in Canada. You will see that for this, for the second price auction, which is the red line, the red line is the ratio between willingness to pay and accept and the willingness to accept and willingness to pay, you will see that the red line started from something like 1.29 and gradually moved to 1. So this is quite clear. This basically is a result by Sjogren and those. But let's look at the ninth price auction with eight subjects. The ratios do not converge and they diverge. They diverge sharply. They go much more beyond even four, like the ratios of four in Hamak and Brown study, which was big enough, four times. They go to even seven times. So this is uh, when Jen Kletch went to Singapore. To, when he visited the uh, US, he told me this problem during lunchtime. So he said, so we have a puzzle. We, this, is quite, uh, this is quite something. We could not explain it. Right? I said, OK, uh, let's run something more and to see how it happens. So we did run this in the US. So that was uh, experimenting in the US, yeah, banking in the US time. So in National University of Singapore, we recruited 40 subjects, four groups, yeah, each with 10 subjects. Two groups of 10 buyers and two groups of 10 sellers. But the design here is a subtle difference, but a very important distinction. Yeah. For, the, for the Vancouver experiment, each subject only names one price. But for the Singapore sub, 
experiment, each player names two prices simultaneously. Yeah. We call it within subject design. I, dis I, I later on found that actually various misuse the same way uh, sometime before, but I did not know this be before. So the same subject name what, and each round they name both a second price and a ninth price. So that's the same person. The same person would write down on a piece of paper one price for the second price auction, as if there would be only one object. Another price is ninth price auction, as if there would be eight objects. The subject did not know beforehand which auction rule would apply. The auction rule would be selected randomly afterwards. That means that they had low knowledge about which auction they would be sitting. So that's the interesting part. The same way, and we have given instructions, we test understanding of the procedures, etc. just repeat uh, the, the process in the uh, Vancouver experiment. We use NUS Max, uh, this, the, the same thing. Shoot them around. Also six rounds. Each round, after each round, also the price of exchanges would take place, but uh, would be revealed, but not the identity. The binding round would be selected random as well. In this experiment, we did not give any constraint on the selling price. Yeah. And we did not offer subjects any participation fee. This is quite tough. Means that they take their own money. They are responsible for whatever they do. We don't compensate. You do badly, you get badly. So, so we, we were not responsible for that. You are responsible for your own behavior. So this is quite tough uh, experiment. So the bidding, the binding price rule would be selected and random as well. Which rule? Second price or lines price? Randomly by one subject. We randomly select one subject. So by giving them some, something, so they pick up from the piece of paper. And this subject randomly pick up something. So we did not know either before which one. The subjects did themselves. Later on, I found that so Werner Smith in 1980, in a book which basically nobody reads, Evaluation of Econometric Methods, he used the same technique. He called it dual market technique. But we did not know that. Only afterwards, we checked the history. We checked the literature. We found this one. So here comes the results. Uh, that's something interesting. What you can see that the same subjects, OK, exactly the same people. For the Vancouver experiment, you may attribute the reasons to be that they are different people. They behave differently. When in the second price auction, they converge. Lines pr price auction, they diverge, right? Here now, they are exactly the same people. But with different rules, they did not know before. So the same people, for the second price auction, their ratio of willingness to accept and willingness to pay converge. Their willingness to accept and the willingness to pay ratio diverges even further. You have nothing to blame. The same people, but the auction rules. They are responsible So for this part. Furthermore, we observe, I personally counted all the data. I checked them one by one myself, not by computer. I checked them one by one. Of course, I run statistics later by computer. But first, I wrote down every pair of prices on a piece of paper, everything here. I tried to observe the things. We found out that 38 out of 440 pairs of bids and asks were the same, but only 15.8%. What does this mean? They are supposed to be the same completely, because they're the same people. Only one subject used the same rule, same price, for both auction price rules 
consistently in six rounds, only one. Range in one. Range in nine, it means that they should behave the same, exactly the same. Only six subjects use the same price for three or more rounds. This is a very sharp contradiction with the victory walking theory. Although this theory won Nobel Prize doesn't matter, it does not describe or explain what's going on here. Experiment three. We are not so sure yet. We run something more. Yeah. So we recruited another 40 subjects. Four groups, each with 10 people. Two groups of buyers, two groups of sellers. Again, this is within subject design. But two prices here. One is for large group, for 10 people there, for the lines price auction. But also for a smaller group, the 10 people were randomly divided into two groups, each with five subjects. Four, five people, so this is the fourth price auction, which means three objects. We try to test the, for the group size. Subjects a lot paid for showing up, low price selling, so the, the same procedure as before. All the things are similar. Uh, so the binding round was selected and random after the working rounds, and which price rule was also selected and random after the experiment, not before. Even the experimenters have no idea what would happen. We try, we just explore. This is what happened. You can see that for the fourth price small groups, with five people, they diverge, but not diverge so much. They diverge to something like 2.5, the ratio. For the ninth price large group, they diverge to more than five times. So we are pretty sure that what is going on there now. Yeah. Only 66 out of 240 pairs of all the bids were asked and asked the same, 27.5%. Only three subjects used the same price for both working rules in six rounds. Only nine subjects submitted used same prices for three or more rounds. Again, very sharp contradiction. They are supposed to be exactly the same for everyone, every round. There should have nothing to do with price, with group size. Victory auction goes for any number of objects, any number of people, no matter how large the group size is. It has no, nothing to do with this one. Yeah. It's a simple mathematics. Yeah. The proof goes for all the situations. So they should not happen. Further, in Chongqing University, I did this one with another 40 subjects. So four groups, each with 10 subjects, again, and two groups of buyers and two groups of sellers. So again, with, we use the within subject design, same subject for two prices. Second price and the ninth price in group of 10, and in smaller groups with the second price and the fourth price in this one. Because the low marks for Chongqing University those days, now Chinese University have marks now. So we used, we bought this so-called graduation photo al albums. So for this experiment, let's see. For the second press auction, they basically go converge. Interesting thing is for the for the Chinese for the main and the Chinese experiments. So. For the fourth price or ninth price, they don't diverge that much. They show a little tendency go down, but still the difference is large enough. Much higher than one. You can see more than three times. I will talk about more experiments later on in mainland of China. Again, we count all those 240 pairs, only seven, 3%. One pair 
was almost 4.99 and 5. You can't find these kind of things by computer. So you can see that I did all the calculations myself by hand. Computers cannot distinguish between 4.99 and 5, right? They can only identify 5 and 5. So, so this, this is something you, so do not completely count on computers. Sometimes you have to check the data yourself yeah, by hand and by your own eyes. This time is even more extreme. No subject used the same price for both working rules consistently and tall in six rounds. Nobody. Yeah. So the Chinese subjects, <laughs> that's interesting. Uh, I wish I, I would run some more, uh, but let's see later. Uh, no subject submitted equal bids or asks for three or more for the six rounds. This is a very sharp contrast with, uh, uh, with a theoretic prediction. So these are statistics. You may not have an idea about the people. right? Let's take a few people out. This, these are the people, OK, the person is there. You see what happens. For example, subject number five. This is in second price versus ninth price. This is willingness to pay group, not group. You can see what this guy is doing. In the second price, this guy is doing is named 3 yuan, 3 yuan, 3 yuan, 2, 4, 2.5, 4. He is not crazy. He was she. He knows exactly what is going on. He's not stupid. You can see for the ninth price, he did for 0 0.5. And he jumped to 1.6, experimented a little bit. Didn't work, right? So he dropped his price for 0 0.35, and then 0 0.5, 0 0.25, 0 0.2. The same person for second price working rule and ninth price working rule, he knows how to distinguish between them. Although he is supposed to be exactly the same in vector auctions by theory. So let's say subject number seven. This is another person, okay, a human being behind the data. Second versus fourth price, in willingness to accept group, this is small group, six rounds. You can see for the second price and the fourth price, this guy is was very interesting. He started with 13 or she, both 13. And then quickly, he or she learned that for the second press, you don't need to bid so high. <laughs> Dropped to 2.5. And then three. Jumped to line, experimented a lot. Didn't, not necessary. Dropped to 5.9, 4.5. But for the fourth price, he or she knows that it won't work in the second price. So 13, 12. 11, 10.5, 12.5, They are not stupid. They are not crazy. They know what is going on. Nothing wrong with the human beings here. Something is wrong with the working rule. So lessons. Let's put a little bit together, summarize it. Contrary to the common understanding, the victory works may not be demand revealing. Theoretically, it's supposed to truthfully reveal demand. You bid as your dominant strategy, your valuation. Your valuation about one object should be the same, right? It has nothing to do with the working rules. Memory stick is memory stick, mark is mark. Why do you have different valuations for the same object under different auction rules? That doesn't make sense. But this is what happened here. Second, the disparity between gains and losses may well be robust over repeated trials. In the second part, I will show you that it's also robust with 60 rounds, 
right? So for six runs, you think it's not. So let's do six zero to see what happens. Yeah. It's the same, I tell you first. So I will show you the evidence. So we need to re-examine behavior foundation or number of issues, for example, in environmental damage evaluation. If there is environmental damage, which one are you going to take? People's willingness to pay or people's willingness to accept? New classic economics tells you that they should be the same. <laughs> oh, that's simple. So far, so good. No. People don't behave in this way. That's a problem. They don't give you the same numbers. When you ask them in different ways, they give you different numbers and sharply diverge. That's a problem. And then you have no idea which one you are going to take. How can you construct your budget? How are you going to design your policy? That's troublesome. Yeah. Conclusion remark. This is what Jen Clatch wrote, because he's very good in this, uh, this literature stuff. I, I like this one, so we must read it. It is in the nature of man's mind, a thing which you have enjoyed and used as your own for a long time where the property of an opinion takes root in your being and cannot be torn away without your resenting the act and trying to defend yourself however you came by it. The law can ask no better justification than the deepest instinct of man. This is by a judge. No, Harvard, no review. If we possess something, we put more value on that. Which means that if you ask me to give up this thing, I will ask more to be compensated than if I am going to acquire it. Even for your opinion. If you form some opinion, it will be more difficult for you to give it up. So we have to be careful as scholars, academics. So sometimes don't defend yourselves too much. You may very well be wrong, but you have this bias because it's your baby. So you like it more. So this is the endowment effect. Let's take Adam Smith. In the theory of moral sentiments, he also wrote this one. We suffer more when we fall from a better to a worse situation than we ever enjoy when we rise from a worse to a better. Uh, the following sentence was written by Jenk. So this seems to be a very general view of most long economists to the point of their wondering why economists think otherwise. It's actually a common sense observation. But professional economists think common people are wrong. In fact, economists themselves are wrong. So this is what we, we call this one. So anything you want to? Discuss? Okay, let me show you the second part. We, we, we have been doing the same thing. The same thing for a decade. Just to try to make sure that we were not wrong. <laughs> we have to be very, very careful. Yeah. So this is I did with my former graduate student and a group of people. So. This was, uh, this was published last year in a Chinese journal in financial science. So what we did was that, so for the previous paper, it was pen, paper and pen, only six rounds. So let's do it a little bit longer. Let's do it in computer laboratory by 60 rounds, and we 10 times it. If we do 60 rounds, it's not possible by hand anymore. You have to use technology. Fortunately, we, I have built one number in Southwest Jotun University in the name of Reinhard Zetten, and it was Herbert Simon. Actually, Professor Zetten suggested to put Herbert Simon's name in front of him. Yeah. So this is called uh, uh, Simon Zetten Behavioral Research Center. We have a, a beautiful and standard laboratory there, which was built exactly on what Bone laboratory was. Yeah. Even the curtain numbers, <laughs> we copied them. So you can run uh, experiments simultaneously in both places. Uh, no, no, no difference. 
80 subjects here, undergraduate students. Males 43, female 37. So the ratio is about one to one, a little bit more higher. Randomly put them into eight groups again, each with 10 subjects. So second prize buyers and sellers, each two groups. Ninth prize buyers and sellers, each two groups. Same working rule, two groups simultaneously, but low interaction between them. So to keep them independent observations. First stage is for price bidding. Buyers or sellers will fill the buying or selling highest or lowest prices, which ranges from zero to 100 integers. With all the 10 subjects of the same group, finish bidding experiments goes to the second stage. Actually, previously, when I was in Bonn for my uh, PhD dissertation, it took me half a year to program. It was computer science was not so good. And this experiment was programmed by my former student only one week. So, it's, uh, and so the, the computer science technology is, uh, has progressed so much. It's, it's really very good. And so you, can, you don't need to have a specific language for this one. As long as you have networked computers, you can do it very easily. Sometimes you can even run the experiments by handphones. So the second stage exhibits the transaction price of own group on computer screen. And whether the subjects got to deal this round or not. So show you this one, but not the identity. When all the subjects see this one, and they confirm, they must confirm, they check it, so goes to the next round. After all the 60 rounds finish, one subject will be randomly picked up to choose one round randomly to compute the payment. So again, we had no idea which round. One subject, the participants, will pick it up randomly. So we have no idea at all. After the experiments, we also did something more. The subjects are paid one by one in sequence. By that time, we can also ask their price estimations. How much you estimate, you think. But this data is not so reliable, because this is what they, what they say. You don't know whether they are telling you the truth or not. So we still rely on the data, the actual price they paid, in the experiment. That's real money. Let's see. This is a experiment one. You can see that for the second price, they basically go very close. Again, like what Shogun they observed. The blue and the, the the above ones, you can see the white range, right? For the last price, they also go diverge very much. Let's check the statistics. The ratio of the mean and the ratio of the medians of WTA to WTP, this time for the second price, they go even under one, 0 0.77, 0 0.74. So the statistic tests are very clear. Ninth price. The ratios of the means and the ratio of the medians, they both go much higher than one. So six times and 10 times higher. Diverge again. So after we 10 times the rounds of the experiment, they still keep the same trend. We're still not so sure. We run something more. Second experiment, we run 40 subjects, also male, female, basically one to one. Randomly, four groups, each group have 10 subjects. Two groups have buyers, two groups have sellers, randomly assigned. Yeah, nobody knows before. Subjects as buyers this time, they need to give both the second price and the ninth price simultaneously at each round. Okay. So we repeat the procedure as the first experiment. Also, they pick up only one round on the payment randomly after the whole experiment. Let's see how it happens. So you can see the yellow and the pink ones. 
they go pretty close. And you can see the blue and the light blue ones, the green ones, they go widely diverge. Again, what we observed in six rounds extend to 60 rounds. Statistics, this is a little bit interesting because the mean ratio is ended up about 0 0.6. The medians goes very, very interesting. They go to even 0 0.28. That's a little bit too much. Yeah. So, but for the other side, for the diverged part, you can see that they go more than four times or six times. So this is very clear. So let's run analysis about the real subjects. Let's see how these subjects are grouped or divided. Yeah. If we define four types by this, mean and variance, we classify them as four types, stable rear, stable extreme, fluctuation rear, and fluctuation extreme. What does this mean? Okay, you can see for all these people, for example, for the second press buyers. Yeah. If you can see the left, the bidding price curves of the same subjects are very similar. Uh, so if the mean estimation, for example, is 41.3, while the real prices of the object which was auctioned was a memory stick, the price was 43. So we define the mean prices of subjects between 30 to 60 and the real type. So they bid and the real valuation. The others, if they go very extreme, we call them extreme types. So the stability goes for the variance. If the variance goes between 0 and 80, so we call them stable type. If they go beyond 80, we call them fluctuation. They fluctuate a lot. This is very typical stable rear. You can see these four subjects, they bid it around 40, the real price. Their variances are not very much. So this is called stable real type. But unfortunately, these good people are very few, only four. Only 10%. So the other part, these are the stable extreme. These guys are stable. They're stable. Their prices are stable, but very extreme. The prices are too high, much, much beyond the real price. So what do these people do? Our speculation, yeah, because we, we have no idea what they think. But we speculate that these people do is that they bid very high prices in order just to get the auction, to be able to get the su subject, the object. Their purpose is not to beat the true valuation. Their purpose is to be successful in auction, to get the object. So they go very extreme, but very stable, up there. So this type is a lot, almost 50%, 47.5%, 19 of them. The other one, fluctuation rear. They beat around the real price of the memory stick, but they fluctuate a lot. They try a lot of ways. These are not very many people as well. Only four, 10% again. How about this one? So these are the extreme people. They beat very high prices or very low prices, and they fluctuate a lot. These are also a lot of them, 13 of them, about 32.5%. What we see here is that the really nice people, the stable ones, <laughs> or the real people around the real price valuations, because for the memory sticks, you can estimate the rough price, right? Everybody. They are very few. The other, a little bit crazy guys, are the most. They don't behave as what you assume they do. So let's say, put in one category. 
you can see that. So for the real stable ones, for like fluctuation real ones, they are not the most ones. The most ones are the stable extreme and the fluctuation extreme. The extreme people. <laughs> so this, we found something quite interesting. We, 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 we ourselves were amused when we identified all those data. So this is a lot of work, let me mention to you, a lot of work. Yeah. So this should be close, but are they close? So this is, you can see it's a very fancy trans uh, PPT, so this is my student did. And my transparencies are always very simple because I don't know how to make these fancy ones. So I did with Chinese, so I had to spend days to translate them into English. And so within the buyers, and uh, you can see all those, the second price uh, uh, means and the last price means, they go a lot of uh, fluctuations here. Yeah. So they should be very similar, but are they similar? No. You can see that they go up a bit. It's always a lot of fun to watch these graphs <laughs> because these are real people. These are real human beings. They are supposed to be similar. No, they don't. So we do some further analysis. If one subject, one subject beats the same for the second price and ninth price auctions, we relax the condition. Okay. If they beat the same prices and ten times and above, remember sixty rounds. Okay. So this requirement is very weak. Out of 60 rounds, if they beat 10 times the same or more, we think that they approximate. How many of them? For this very weak requirement, only three. Only three. We can name them by their identification numbers, P13, P18, and for seller, only one, P3. Compare the 2001 experiment, there was only one subject bid the same for all six rounds. Six subjects bid the same for three more rounds. We human beings are far away from the rationality assumption in economics. Most of us are not at all. Yeah. New findings, let's say, so for the second price and ninth price consistently, for the 4,200 sets of data, 40 subjects multiplied by 60 rounds, this is 10 times higher, more than the previous experiment, only 4.29% they beat the same consistently, much less than six rounds. So when we run more rounds, they diverge even more. Six rounds, still 15.8% consistent. Here, much, much less in percentage. Another new finding. This is something one cannot observe with six rounds. For the six rounds, these are the tendencies they go. Let's say for the 60 rounds. For six rounds of this experiment, similar, but if we go for 60 rounds, this is what one can see only with the help of computer science, with bigger data set. <laughs> Small data set, you can see that. So you can see that with only six rounds, the tendency was going to converge or diverge, right? But after nine rounds, they stabilize. You won't be able to observe this with less than nine rounds. After nine rounds, all the bidding or asking prices go stable. We can see the variance. The variance for the six rounds, the average for the, after the ninth round, you can see that the variance average is, means very small. The green part, they stabilize. The pink part is the one to six rounds in 2001 experiment. 
So this is clear evidence with very clear statistics. So after a series of studies, a long of experiments, we are pretty confident the endowment effect goes robust. What Shugran and their AER papers discovered was a special case. Only for one, one object, second prize. They discovered a very special case. The most other cases, basically all the other cases, don't go that way, don't go nicely. They diverge, diverge badly. So that one we are quite confident. Now we end, we enter a new stage. So how about the other one? Competition intensity. If we change the ratio between the objects and the people, we use this variable to test what is going on. So if you have any issue you want to discuss, let me know. Yeah. So now let's go for the third one. This is still going on. Yeah, we haven't finished this one completely yet, but we have run some pilot studies. I have several pretty good students, so we have done this one. So this, is, this experiment was done a few years ago in Peking University. So we defined a new concept. This is a concept completely new in the literature. Nobody else has ever done or even proposed this one. I will tell you that it will be very interesting for the internet stuff. Now we propose a concept called competition intensity. This is defined as the ratio between the number of bidders and the number of objects being auctioned. How many people there? So we recruited 70 students from different parts of Peking University. And this time is a notebook, not a computer, OK, the normal notebook with Peking University and uh, brand in the shops. It's actually pretty cheap there. It's priced only 5 yuan. Auction method, we use the fourth price auction, six groups. Again, okay. now we have three buyers, three sellers, with five bidders. 10 bidders, 20 bidders, each group. Three groups of buyers, three gr groups of sellers. Each subject participates in only one auction and one of six time slots in three days. So it's a lot of logistics, yeah, but a lot difficult. This one is paper and pencil. Yeah. So we haven't run by a uh, large size because large size requires a lot of computers. So we cannot do that for this moment. So we paid them a show-up fee this time for 15 yuan. So if you manage to sell it, so you get more money. If you buy it, you get less money, right? You, but you get one more, one book, notebook. For each seller, if among the three lowest selling prices, his or her income would be 5 yuan plus the fourth lowest selling price, getting money. The others keep the 5 yuan and the notebook. All the procedures follow the 2000 2001 study. So let's see the intensity of competition. For the group of five subjects, the intensity is 1.67, 5 over 3. The ratio of mean willingness to pay to willingness to accept is 4.21. Median ratio is 4.76. For groups of 10 subjects, competition intensity is 3.33. And the ratio drops significantly to 1.63. Median ratio to 2. For the 20 subjects, the competition intensity is 6.67. The ratio goes even more, even lower. It's 1.56, but but not that much lower. Okay. So it remains an open question. 
if we increase the size of the group, right, what would happen? Yeah. So observation, when, we, when the competition intensity increases, the ratio gradually decreases. It actually goes with our intuition, right? When the competition is fast, you, the ratios would converge more yeah. because it's becoming more and more similar to the second price auction in this sense. Let's see the curves. These are the mean WTP and WTA curves. You can see pretty clearly that they go to the trend of what we just showed. Individual data. For the individual data, if we classify the subjects into three groups, speculative, stable, and trading. What does it mean by speculative? If one subject bids 50% higher or lower than the previous round, who was bidding, bidding smoothly, and it suddenly jumps or suddenly lowers, we would define them as speculative. Yeah. So this is a very typical feature that they learn that they, because it's randomly run, randomly selected for one round for payment, right? So I, ex I would just speculate in order to get the sub object. Remember the auction rule. You don't pay by your bidding price. You pay by the next highest bidding price. So you don't suffer from this one. You just try to get the object. So findings, so A4, A5, C6, all those the people, so nine subjects, they account for about 13%. They are speculative. Stable. If we define the standard deviation of the subject's bidding prices is less than 0 0.5, we call the subject stable. Stable does not necessarily mean that they do the true value. It only means that the bidding prices or asking prices are close enough. Not necessarily the true valuation. Yeah. How many subjects? 19 subjects, 27.1% of the total. Trading. If the standard deviation of the subjects' bidding prices is less than one and the absolute value of the average of six rounds bidding prices minus the average of transaction prices is not greater than 0 0.5. We call them trading. So this has two features. The bidding prices are relatively stable with a continuous valuation of the auctioned objects, relaxed definition of the stable type, and also the average of subjects' bidding prices tend to be close to the average of the transaction prices. How many of them? 22. These are the most. More than 30% of the total subjects. So trading subjects in the group of 20 subjects, be very careful. 20 subjects is the largest group. So when the group becomes very large, the trading subjects account for almost 64% of the trading subjects. But in the smallest group, the trading subjects have only five. When they go large, more people go for trading. So the trading subjects tend to show their true valuation of the auction objects, the differences between their WTA and WTP are relatively smaller. This is what we found out. So this is something. And uh, the other subjects have low patterns. Yeah. They don't come up together. Right? They have the different scan here and there. So we cannot find any stable pattern for that. So this comes the interesting part. Participants seem to, instead to be responding to strategic motivations, quite apart from valuations, and to context 
influences that were induced by this auction design. Very typical, the speculative subjects. Second, when we increase the competition intensity to more than three, and even more, to 6.67, the ratio between WT and WTP becomes much closer to one. Not one yet, much closer to one. This trend becomes clear with the increase of competing intensity. But since our groups are still not, not enough, and we have not repeated long enough, we cannot claim stronger statements. These are the conservative statements, but they show stable tendency. So they seem to narrow down the differences. To how much extent, we don't know yet. Because this kind of study needs much more money, <laughs> much more rounds, much larger subject pools. More subjects means more money. <laughs> and so you have to be very careful. So this is a part. So we, we always very careful. We try to pilot and experiment a little bit first. Observation three. The existing literature shows that difference between WTA and WTP almost dis disappears with only one object on the second price victory auction. But the differences would diverge further with more sub objects on the second price and other price victory auction. So if we regard the second price victory auction with one object, the showground case, if we take them as a standard status, we call them standard status, so very small differences between WTA and WTP. No matter whether the number of participants increases, as long as the auction object is one only, the difference between WTA and WTP is always very small. So what this experiment tells us? If we continue to increase the size of the groups here, have more people here. What would we expect? With fixed number of objects, okay, be very careful. This is the difference between the second experiment, okay? We fix the number of objects, we increase the size of the groups, and then we increase the so called competition intensity, the ratio between number of participants and the number of objects to be auctioned. This is a very interesting part for this one. So we did large scale experiments. How large? We cannot do the laboratory anymore. This one can only be run with the internet. Because the laboratories, you have a fixed number of computer terminals. You go for 20, you go for 50, it would be large enough. If you really want to run this one, you have to go for the internet experiments with no significant limitation of numbers of subjects, the participants. There are two problems here. First, when you go to the internet experiment, you lose control, right? In the experiment, you can control them. You can watch them. You don't interact with each other. You don't talk to each other. You don't collude. On the internet, they can do anything they like. You cannot watch them. So this is first one. Second, on the internet experiment, how can you run the repeated ones? You can run once. How about a second time, third time? So this is a real issue here. Huh? So have you to be very careful. So on the internet, you can do large scale experiments, but basically one shot. And even for the one shot, data is a lot clean, because you have low guarantee that people don't talk there, collude there, form groups there. Our speculation for this interesting part is that we have no idea how to do this one. So it would be very interesting and would be very welcome you can, if you can propose something new. 
because our intuition here goes. On the internet, if you work in something, there can be millions of participants, right? The number of objects working is very limited, but the number of participants can be huge. That means huge, very big competition intensity, right? Millions of people or thousands of people bid for a few objects. Would the results tend to be like the second price auction for only one object? If that is true, victory comes back. That's a beautiful part. All the economists would love it. If that is true, short ground study would be revived. They would be able to stay. Otherwise, they would be gone. So, but this has a very big technical obstacle so far. So we run these only pilot studies to see the tendency. But we have very strong intuition that it will be very possibly like this. So we go into the new era now. So the unsealed water, <laughs> nobody knows, because our limitation of technology cannot let us run tests for this one, unless we find some very smart ways. Yeah. There can be ways. For example, one paper published in AER, actually, uh, actually I reviewed that paper, but it doesn't matter, I can say that now. It was, uh, it was about the centipede game, right? The, the authors were very smart. They used hand phones hand phones to do this one. To do what? Between the people, the players, yeah, the, that's a very, very nice study. Yeah, very clever design. Because centipede game, you know, it's, it's, it's about rationality, right? So they select the ordinary people to play against each other, and they selected the chess masters. Chess masters are best at bank code induction, right? So when they play centipede games, they would identify and, and immediately realize it's bankrupt induction. So I stop at round one, right? And the results should exactly that. For the ordinary people, they would go three or four rounds. That one was also because it's not possible to, to gather the computer, the chess masters and to the computer laboratory. They went to some chess tournaments. So they used hand phones. But still, because of the number of participants, was limited, right? So they can use the hand phones under a controlled situation. Nevertheless, I just want to say that it is possible, but it takes some very smart design to how to control for the unobserved features, how to control for the risk. So this is what I want to mention. Yeah. So this is what we have done a little bit in the past Oh, now it's almost 20 years now. <laughs> so <laughs> we just go this one around and around and see how things go on, because this is a real puzzle in this field, not only for environmental goods, but also for financial markets as well. So for your evaluation, for, your, for the valuation of the same, same object, why do you have different values there? Should that be? So this is, so this is, why, uh, why the Nobel Prize uh, awarded to, uh, to Professor Sile? Uh, so it's, uh, it's called behavior finance, right? So the behavior of this, these parties. You know. So this is what we, we do. And it's not finished, completely finished yet. We have some, yeah, some implications, but would be interesting to continue and to see. Yeah, so this is what I report. Any issues you want to discuss?